Musicians in studios drinking Timmy's and stuff. Oh yeah, too. bud. <laughs> How you doing? Doing great, man. Cup of coffee Dylan in Hennessey. the studio. Life is good. Thanks for hey. having me on. Hey, thanks for being here. I mean, there. Why don't you tell yeah. us what you're up to right now? Uh, right now, what I'm up to is I'm releasing a new video for my band Mobius Radio with myself and Alex Van Briggle. Other people might know him better as a violinist. April 16th, we got a music video dropping. Other than that, just working on producing a backlog of material and uh, that'll be rolling out over this year. I'll tell you a bit about it quickly though. Uh, sure. It's a bit of an oddity as far as a single goes because it is an instrumental and it is a remix and it is a cover and it is a collaboration. So it's a, it's a bit of a unique project and, and we kind of have this video to tie everything in together. But uh, Dr. Drop is a, a violinist that's traveled the world over like several times. Um, been lucky, been able to play with him over the years and stuff. And we've been wanting to do something together. And he approached me to remix one of his songs and came up with something that was really cool, I think. And Alex worked on doing the drums for it, which is great over quarantine. It's been hard to get Alex, the drummer of Mobius Radio to really work on stuff just from logistics. So it was nice to be able to do that. Uh, and he recorded new parts for it. So it's like a relaunch of one of his songs remixed by myself. And we made a really fun video for it. Uh, that'll be out April 16th. Yeah. That's cool. Uh it's called the Jake revival. The original song is just called Jake. Yeah. I'm, I'm super excited for it. Uh, we put a lot of heart into this one. It, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's in the string of Mobius radio songs, which is, uh, like what I perform live regularly and kind of, I think what I'm maybe best known to do, uh, which is like live looping shows, um, with Alex Van Briggle on the drums. Uh, we, I have been performing under my own name for many years and started as a singer songwriter and went into this world of looping and incorporating more heavier rock music and electronic influence into what we were doing. And so at the time that we rebranded, we weren't able to launch our new band because of COVID. Uh, but ever since then, we've been kind of releasing singles under the brand of Mobius Radio to have our studio side of stuff kind of handled by the time we get back to live. So this is going under that. Um, and it'll be up there with the rest of the Mobius Radio material. Is that, are you uh, planning a, an EP or LP release? I thought about that a lot in the last few months. And I think I'd just like to roll out singles for the next year or so. And I think until the end of the year, kind of like my benchmark is I'd like to do one every six weeks or so. A common strategy lately. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, it's just, um, I spent a lot of last year sort of getting the ball rolling on producing these songs. I always had like a bit of an issue with the looping stuff around like, how do I produce this stuff to not sound like a guy with an acoustic guitar and beatboxing? And right. it, it took a lot of hours of me like sitting on Cubase and the computer here and just sort of like figuring out what could these things sound like if they were studio arrangements of the live songs. And I think I figured it out. So a lot of these songs are going to be coming out over the year. Eugene's great. And uh, inspiring guy. Yeah. yeah. De definitely a very eccentric human and just like a crazy good energy to be around. Awesome yeah, guy. Great, great creativity. Yeah. And, uh, and, and same, same for you. And so let's hear more nice. about uh, some other collaborations that you've had. Tell us about some of your other favorite people that you've worked with. You know, so, so hearkening back to the old days when we had live music and you had to walk uphill to the venue. Um, I mean, I've gotten to do a handful of shows at Bovine. That's, that's like my home away from home venue, right? Uh, I really love getting to play with Mono Whales. They have obviously been killing it. I know that you had an interview with Sally Shar on the show and everything. Um, Many years ago. Yeah. And so th there's some role models in the community, honestly. Um, love any time that I get to play with the Crooked. You know, but these are more like just people that I kind of get to share the stage with. I was really looking forward to uh, the Mobius Radio launch show that we had planned at Bovine that was going to be with Goodnight Sunrise, Queens and Kings, and Cigar Club, and all three of them are like killing it. Um, yeah. So, you know, crossing fingers that by the time that we're able to resume live, uh, we plan on doing that show with the original lineup still. So uh, I'll be really excited for that. And then I guess otherwise, people I like to work with, my dad, me and him have an acoustic duo together called Two Shots oh, of Hennessy. So, yeah, um, love doing called? stuff with him. Two Shots of Hennessy. Two Shots of Hennessy, brilliant. That's yeah, cool. so we have a ton What's of fun doing play? that. Uh, so he, I guess, when I was younger, I remember him singing a ton. 
and he kind of blew out his vocal cords a bit, but that left him with like this Tom Waits really raspy kind of <laughs> voice, right? Um, so he'll sing like deeper parts. And over the years, he's picked up percussion and not like a traditional drum kit. He's built this acoustic kit out of a cajon drum as the centerpiece. He has a couple cymbals in front of him. Uh, he has like this bass stomper pedal thing and a tambourine on his left foot. And the result of that is just like, it's just a perfect acoustic accompaniment kit okay. of his own design. And he also plays a mean harmonica. He's like a big blues guy, right? So he picked up the harp like 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, we just kind of do a mix of different acoustic styles. Some things are a little high energy, a lot of ballads, a lot of folky stuff, some blues. And uh, we kind of like switch off the singing and everything. And, you know, just the sentiment of being able to get to do that with him is like, it's special for me every time. We have a lot of fun doing that. That's so, great to hear. People breaking yeah. the generation gap is great to hear. Yeah, especially like over COVID when it's like, there's hardly any people you can see. And, you know, just being able to do that with him. Those have been some of my uh, favorite memories of like do doing anything like live streaming. Yeah. Uh, we did a St. Patrick's Day show recently that, you know, it's kind of like an annual tradition for us really. It's like, we'll get together, we'll have a couple drinks, we'll get on a live stream and we'll play some songs. So it was nice to get to do that again this year with him. Cool. Yeah. You mentioned the bow. Yeah, oh yeah. You mentioned the bow. Do, you any, do you have any other great favorite places or places you've played? Cherry you Colas and, and Bovine is like yeah. jumping back and forth all night. I mean, Horseshoe Tavern, just basically the Queen Street Strip. Um, we hope they all survive. Yeah, I'm honestly surprised and very happy to see how they've been doing so far. I mean, I don't have any insider information, obviously, but it's nice to see that Bovine are constantly updating all their uh, Instagram and Facebook pages and they got new merch coming out and people are snagging it like crazy. Like it just fills up my heart. You know, Cherry Colas did a GoFundMe to try and keep the venue afloat and people donated a crazy amount of money, which was also awesome. So, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, I hope that they all pull through. Yeah. Great news. Um, any other places have you traveled around much? Yeah, I've gotten to travel a little bit. I mean, the, the first one that comes to mind is, and probably my favorite one, where I know Dr. Draw from was I got to go to Israel and Manchester oh. and play some shows out there. Oh. Um, I did a talent show like four years ago with the looping stuff. I did a dubstep arrangement of Get Up, Stand Up on acoustic guitar nice. for like this uh, Jewish talent show for like 60-year-old Russian women, and they seem <laughs> to like it. So cool. Um, and Eugene was one of the judges. So, so that's where I met him. I was going to hold off on the question, but you have to yeah. find words. <laughs> oh, with him? <laughs> that whole thing just sounds hilarious. Well, you know, what was cool was like when he, he basically like presents me with like the first place thing. And he, he told me like on the stage, like, you got to make me a promise, though. You got to go busking on the streets in Israel. And I did like wow. a few times. And it was a lot of fun. I actually met some people out there that were musicians that I went busking with as well. Um, you know, one, one time we stayed up until like five in the morning because like a group of tourists walked by and sat down with us and just kept throwing money at us. And we made like 200 bucks in a night just entertaining drunk people in Israel. Um, and then uh, I went and played Indie Week Manchester during that same trip, which was a big treat for me also. I'd never been there before and haven't been back since. But uh, I got to play, I think, five shows in five days there. And it was a blast. Yeah. Where are you from? Uh, I am from, I like to say I'm from Toronto, but everyone does. So really, I'm from North York, and I live in Thornhill. Tell us what's your, what's your link with North York then from the past? Uh, just like growing up around there, really, and just like different parks I would hang out in. Um, you know, they got Lee Lifeson Park now, which I think is cool. I spent a lot of time in Earl Dales. This is cool. I went there and filmed a video once. Uh, it, it's like the only style of video like this that I ever did, but I, I did like a big presentation on why do we love music and okay. try to do a bunch of research and really kind of get to the bottom of it and like why do humans connect with it this is so great because for the past couple of years i've been asking the question on this interview show that i mm -hmm. stole from the woodstock movie and it's crazy because this guy shows up in a suit and tie everybody's covered in mud and he asks that very question and they answer so eloquently. I thought everybody was on brown acid, but it was so eloquent. I was very impressed. Well, they were. Question. Their minds were just open and they had these like ethereal answers, I think. So, <laughs> but so but I have to go watch the interviews. I don't know. 
Um, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't on acid when I made this video. <laughs> so that's a good start. Um, so basically what it comes down to, it, like the first place to start really is uh, art is expression where words alone are not. And what that kind of gets into is this idea that, uh, you know, say someone comes up to you and says, I just broke up with my girlfriend. I'm really sad. You feel bad from them, but it's like a logical thing, right? You kind of understand that they broke up with somebody, but it's not your experience. Um, when you present the arts though, it's like this sensory engagement, whether it's visual art or whether it's, uh, or whether it's music or whether or not it's movies or something that combines multiple senses and like the experience sort of becomes your own. So if you hear that in a song, it's like you feel bad for them, but you almost feel bad for yourself too. Um, because it, it's just like, it's connecting with you on a sensory engagement level and, and providing subjective experience rather than logical explanation. Let me see if I understand that bit. It's, yeah, uh, you're connecting and mirroring, and in in that way, yes, trying to connect the same interpretation. Yeah, and you, you can't describe music to someone. Imagine someone's never heard it. You could try. You know, there's actually a lot you can say about it. We have a whole music theory devoted to it. But if no one's ever heard it, it's just going to mean nothing. And but as soon true. as they hear it, it's like there's this thing that becomes part of an experience for them. There's also this phenomenon yeah. about like it being attached to experiences in our lives and this idea right. that like, you know, if you hear a song as background music at work, you might not remember it the same way as if you had heard that same song uh, being danced to at a wedding for the first time. Right. For sure. And so. different age groups, uh, music yeah. at different times of your yeah. life. It, sure. Yeah, it'll connect with you through your youth or yeah. And again, it gets attached to like, specific memories. Yeah. Um, and you know the the amount with which that even happens is like dependent very much on like how present was that performer at the time of giving that performance and how skilled of a musician are they? That's good. Identifying emotions is is important, uh, yeah, especially in the mental health era. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, so so you're doing great. I mean, I I don't know what to ask. You've got great stories. And uh, what else do you want to talk about? Your gear. I'm gonna give you a little. Do it. Boom, here we go. So this is my baby. Um, this is, go real I never, slow. It's, it, I never uh, got to hit the stage with this, but this was the rig that I built for Mobius Radio. I designed this two tier pedal board and went to Stage Master Canada and we bounced a couple ideas back and forth and they built me this platform to house everything. Uh, awesome. and, and, you know, it kind of all ties into this looping rig that I've been using for a long time. Um, Guy on the left over here does some vocal effects. If I want delays or harmonies and things like that, I have that here. The guy up top does all my guitar effects and it's an amp modeler. So I don't need to use a guitar amp for anything I do. It's all uh, digital and I can sort of like program out all my songs and actually have a computer program that lets me sort of sit at the computer and dial in tones that I want and then save them onto this, which is just super convenient. So that's what your feet are doing. Why don't you... Uh... Tell us about your favorite guitar. Ooh, okay. Yes, yeah. so I got a few here behind me. So another video that I did during quarantine was I, I actually had that question. I was like, what's my favorite guitar? I <laughs> have about 20. Um, and I actually, just as a little project for myself, I made a marking sheet and just kind of went through and assessed all of my instruments. And I was like, what's the best thing here? And it is this one, I think. Wow. Objectively speaking, anyways, this is a Music Man JP6, the signature guitar of my guitar hero, basically a John Petrucci of Dream Theater. Oh, that's great. Um, and it plays like a dream. Um, I mean, you can shred on it the way that he does, but really, it's a very versatile instrument. You can get super good blues tone out of it and everything as well, and do things that are a lot more subtle. And it's just, oh, it's so good. I have a, a, a good little mix of like acoustic and electric. I think if you ask me at any different point in life, which of the two I prefer, I'm always gonna have a different answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, I was lucky when I was 14 years old, I got given a Taylor guitar by my uncle, which is like stashed away right now. I'm not gonna pull that one out at the moment, but uh, it's been to hell and back over the course of 15 years. Uh, it was the one that came with me over to Israel and Manchester. Right. Um, so, you know, it's, it's got some wear and for all intents and purposes, like it should not function anymore, but it does. It still sounds good. So I love I, I that one. The, I suppose the acoustic right beside you is the one you use the most. 
Um, this is the one I reached for, but as it so happens, this is one that I bought off of a homeless guy on the subway for 60 bucks. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, it was just like, this thing was super dirty. And I, I sat down beside the guy and I had a guitar case. And he's like, why don't you open up? Let's jam. All right. <laughs> and we did. And he told me he was trying to sell it and he was getting off at the next station. He's like, Hey, if you got 60 bucks in your pocket right now, I'll sell this to you. So I oh had gosh. 60 bucks. I gave it to him. He gave me the guitar. He walked off the subway and this was not a good shape, but I took it home and stayed up till like five in the morning, just like cleaning it and trying to adjust it and everything. And ever since it's like, Oh, it's so nice. It's actually one of my best setup instruments. Objectively speaking, I, I think it's better than the Taylor is. Yeah. Oh. Give me a little sample of this guy. <laughs> ah. I don't know how well it'll translate over the phone microphone, but. It's like very wow. comfortable to play. And you can just get ripping on it really easy. It feels like an electric guitar, and I don't get that out of a lot of acoustics. It's nice to see it in action. That was some cool riffing. So well, thanks, where did we leave off now, people? Do you want to go into the influences now? Uh, yeah, why not? Let's, let's chat a little bit of influences, because they are very varied. And I think the more time I spend around musicians in Toronto's rock community, I find out that not all of their influences are what they sound like at all, right? Um, so for me, I mean, I already said Dream Theater, are like one of my all-time favorite bands. Right. In more recent years, Polyphia, who I know your son listens to yeah. a lot, are like one of my favorite bands ever. Cool. Um, I think they're so inventive and it sounds very cool to hear the guitar do something new, which they really did. They brought guitar into trap music and I just thought that was really neat. Um, and beyond that, Infected Mushroom are an Israeli psy trance duo credited for inventing the genre, which is like about as much as you could do with a four to the floor bass drum, just thumping, imagining like sweaty rave energy, but with a live band <laughs> and they yeah. sound incredible and their live shows are extremely dynamic and they make cool. very interesting music. So I love them. Um, Cell Dweller is more of like an industrial one man show that also just like produces a ton on Cubase and I do a kind of similar thing to that. And then over COVID, honestly, I've been listening to like a lot of hip hop, um, 90s stuff, primarily probably in early 2000s. Um, it's kind of all over the map. That's like really diverse. And, you know, we talk about genres and things like that. And what do you think is going to emerge as the to be totally honest, I thought by now we were already going to hear more somber music bleeding into the mainstream, and I haven't really heard that yet. Not so much anyways. Not in the way that I thought I would have. So There's maybe no we're just going to skip over that, and just the feel-good is going to ramp up like crazy when people are able to go out again. Yeah. Uh, I think as time goes on also, like, you know, what we hear initially that puts us off in five or ten years, we look back on and reminisce about. So. Sure. I feel like by the time that we're out of lockdown, we're going to be looking back at like 2010, 2015 sounds and bring that into the rock scope of things. Um, you know, I, I'd like to say that it's <laughs> catching up with exactly where hip hop is right now and stuff like that, but I, I don't think that would make sense. But you see like Polyphia, for example, are a good example of that. They had a record in 2018 that did guitar over stuff that was starting to come out in like 2012 or 2013. So... Um, I think we might see that kind of like mirrored as time goes on as well. Alternative channels are being really pumped up because I think yeah. the pop is so extremely pop that it is. people yeah. who are alternative really want more of a voice and it turns them kind of more extreme onto their alternative genres. And I guess there's more room for that now that there's not like, like a a straight drive mainstream narrative going on in the world of Spotify, right? I mean, you have playlists that are more dominant than others, sure. But it would be like trying to compete in a market of like a thousand radio stations. You know, it's it's wide. You could kind of go it's wherever you want. Yeah. The world is even more so going to streaming now. Like we're gonna see less and less of that thing specifically. Um, however, I think it'll be interesting to see when, uh, you see Spotify bought the Joe Rogan podcast a little bit back, right? So that okay. was like, 
the first thing that sort of signaled off like, oh, like streaming services are going to start buying out the rights to libraries the same way that yes. like Netflix is, for instance. But now yeah. it's like, when is Spotify going to drop like $200 million to buy Drake? And okay. what kind of a market is that going to create where like markets are trying to sell a catalog to a streaming service in order to try and bank off of that? Like, I, I think that'll start happening. Crazy. Yeah, the Joe Rogan podcast was a $100 million contract. That's insane. That's, yeah, that's, it's nuts. This podcast you know, is know fantastic. I, do you know how much I make on musicians in bars getting Tim Hortons coffee? Is it enough to get me a Tim Hortons coffee? <laughs> no, not enough, to get, not enough to get me on the bus. I usually ride my bicycle to interviews. <laughs> you know what? That's good for you, man. Do it. It is. <laughs> I need Especially to get back now. on that. Yeah. I'm missing that contact. I would love to grab an acoustic guitar and go to a park and do like an acoustic picnic type thing. A small show with like 20 people in a park somewhere, maybe like a few people on blankets just like spread around. I think that just sounds so nice. I've done it on so. my front lawn. Yeah? How was that? It works good. Yeah. Everybody's, you know, distant. You just have to go home in an hour instead of using my bathroom. <laughs> I would have to put together a set of instrumental essentially. I think that's the only way to really be able to potentially do it safely is if I can do something where I'm wearing a mask the whole time and I'm yeah. not going to be yelling on a street, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, which actually is probably pretty doable. I mean, even singing with a mask on into a microphone and doing some busking that way, because a couple of years ago, I was busking like crazy and it's so yeah. fun. Yeah. Some, of, some of my best memories have been busking. And it's like such a wild ride every time you do it, especially in like a chaotic environment. But, you know. Okay, so where's your craziest busk? Where's the craziest busk? Uh, anytime going to Dundas Square is always really intimidating. Yeah. Uh, and you have to be ready to be loud and put some people off who just don't like loud noise. But... It's a risk versus reward thing because the most I've ever made has also been there. Um, and, you know, obviously I, I'm not going to go there now because in, in, an, in an ideal scenario, I throw down my looping gear and maybe like do an arrangement of like a Pink Floyd song or something like that. By the end of the song, there's like 50, 60 people standing around and then, you know, you end the That's song great. and they all come forward and drop off a bunch of cash. That's um, nice. But then by contrast also, like I remember being there and I'm playing all along the watchtower. And this guy like stands like three feet away from me for the whole second half of the song, obviously looking at me like he's about to confront me after the song is done. And so I'm like, okay, can I play an extended version of the song? I don't want to deal with this guy. <laughs> um, but eventually the song does come to a close and he just sort of like looks at me and he's like, you think you're so good standing here playing the guitar so loud and just annoying everyone. Yeah. And you know, and just like really gets aggressive. I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry you don't like it. This is what I do to make money. And have a license, and, have a license and, to do this. Yeah. And an adjacent guy who was watching this came over and confronted him. I'm like, save my ass. It was like, yeah. And the two of them got in like a bit of a bicker, like they didn't fight or anything, but they both walked off in the different directions. That other guy just looked at me and like was like, yo, I got you. I'm like, yo, this world has some good people. Thank you. <laughs> I'm feeling that tragically hip song poets coming on. Yeah, don't tell me what the poets are doing. <laughs> That guy was talking tough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I was on such That's a good story earlier this year, man. I, uh, in, in October, in November, basically, I listened through every studio song they ever made. It was like 14 records. It was great. I had heard like all their singles throughout my life, but never really took a deep dive on them like that. And it was special. They're great. So I just love dropped them. the head. I needed to go off on that tangent. I, I love them, man. No, I love them. There's a big love-hate thing going on with that band, and I'm on the love side. Cool. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I love the hip. Yeah, man. Absolutely. It's uh, a big depth of a band. I think if someone asked me, and I only came to this recently, what my favorite song is, if I had to pick one, I think it's A Head by a Century. And... Yeah, not because like not because it's even in my wheelhouse of like my favorite genres or like this crazy musicianship, but just it's a beautiful song and it just has a lot of threads in my life and hearing it throughout my life and memories associated to it, right? It's a special one. It's really good. It's a it's a brilliantly written tune and uh, mm -hmm. it's very humble to sing. Yeah. It does inspire a lot of different uh 
relationship kinds of things like people you respect and stuff yeah so i i I was uh like nine or ten years old and my dad would take me on weekends and he had a rehearsal with a band that he was jamming with and i would go sit in the back room and like listen to them play and sit on the tv there and like play video games or whatever and they used to cover that song all the time and just like hearing him sing it all, all these times throughout life and then hearing it on road trips as we were like driving out places and then getting older and now when we play our shows together we usually cover that song so yeah very yeah, nice. it's got some sentiment so that's the hip any other bands that you've uh like bands that i've taken the deep dive on yeah so i guess more recently honestly it's been eminem um oh yeah yeah you did some uh, covers of eminem well i i've been covering the real slim shady for six years now and i do like a medley section in the middle of it and everything and somehow in like the last month and a half, it occurred to me, like, I should probably learn some more Eminem songs. And as I was sitting there, I, I sort of have this idea too about like making these Eminem skits. And so I've been doing those and I made like six or seven of them now. And they're, they're a lot of fun to make. It's just something very different. And, you know, people seem to like it. And while we're all locked in, why not get some good laughs, right? So, uh, but on the other side of COVID, I'm going to do an Eminem tribute. I got to figure out exactly what I'm doing with that, but I have like a songbook of Eminem songs and I can play like eight of them now. I am one thing, but memorizing the lyrics is another. It's been so tough. Yeah. (laughs) Like a lot of them were songs I was familiar with, but didn't know intimately. And then some of them were like a cold read where it's like, you know, the song Till I Collapse, for instance, has over a billion streams on Spotify and somehow I had never heard it. That's going to be a big challenge because, you know, every one of these songs is like two full pages of lyrics. Oh, yeah. And and he's one of those rappers where, like, if you miss a syllable, it throws off the cadence of the entire verse and sure. you're going to fuck it up. So you really got to be, like, on point with it. But right. a lot of these arrangements have been, like, such a fun challenge to try and do. It's rhythmic and really fast as far, you know. Yeah. He set a record. Yeah, like I just I've described Eminem as being the Yangui Malmsteen of rap, who you might know who that is, but <laughs> like shred God basically. And Eminem yeah. does that with words, right? Where sure. if you look at the song Godzilla, for instance, he's like 30 years deep into his career and his most technical passage he's ever written came out like in the last year and a half. So he's still like trying to be anti on himself. A lot of people don't like that style. I think it's just like a part of his evolution as an artist or like, you know, he was making a lot of songs that were like really uh, like difficult to listen to because they were so emotionally driven earlier on in his career. And as time goes on, he's just like, I just want to age into being like the great at this. And so I'm just going to keep on pushing the pen as far as I can. And I think that's cool. You know, go for it, dude. (laughs) And, you know, so my younger brother is 11 years old and he's like a hip hop modern trap music fanatic loves it and eminem is still relevant in that world which is crazy like no one else from that era is you know maybe like kanye that's about it yeah so he listens to drake and things like that yeah like huge on it and uh how do you feel about that music initially it was kind of funny to me being like the older brother and then watching the younger brother grow up with like none of the same music as me just because i i didn't expect that but like growing up and seeing that happen, it's like, it's fine. We are like identical personalities and like everything else. But then more recently, I've sort of turned around and been like, well, let me not be so closed-minded in thinking that just because I play music that I know any more about it than anyone else does. It's like the love of music doesn't change if you're a musician. You know what I mean? There can be someone who plays piano every day and doesn't love music as much as someone who's never tried to play an instrument in their life. So... Right. So and let genre me, wise, we talked yeah. about genres earlier, so it's it's kind of the same thing where you you're open to it if it's good. Yeah. It's subjective. Yeah, it's, you like it's it. more it's like good. what does it what does it do for you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and like one of them for me is Ian DeSaw and Billy Talent, and it's like he's the Queen Street West guy, right? So Street West guy. <laughs> yeah, like there's been a lot of cool things to sort of emerge out of this one kilometer strip in Toronto. <laughs> I'd love to get like a a musician's skate meet going on at some point but i've been skateboarding for as long as i've been playing guitar especially like in recent 
in the last year, I've been at it like real hard since there's not much else to go do. So, Talks about the skateboard park. So they built one around the corner from where I live and that's been really nice actually. Like we're talking about the Queen Street West community and like I've been missing that so much. Just the community sense, being able to show up somewhere and have like a common rotating cast of people that are like always coming in and out and going to check things out, right? So you get that at the skate park. There's like 20, 30 guys and girls that are all going there now and just sort of like working the chops and we're all pushing each other. And it's just a place that you can drop in, no pun intended, and just go connect with some people in a safe way right now, which is super nice. But I'm almost 30 and I'm like better at skateboarding than I've been at any point in my life right now, which is just weird to think. I wouldn't have expected that, but COVID's kind of like pushed me into the zone where in order to get that community feeling, I get on the board. And I go around the corner and I'm just like working the chops on it. And it's been really good for my physical and mental health. <laughs> been loving it. Absolutely. For sure. <laughs> and like w- watching that over the last, you know, since I was a kid basically has been really interesting to see the way that perception on it's changed. It's going to be in the, the Olympic Games whenever they're able to do it, which I think is going to be the summer, but we'll see. Good job. Yeah. Yeah, and they're they're representing it really well with the events that they're putting in. The other thing too is like the emerging of women's skateboarding, and especially like in Toronto, but globally has been huge. I remember it being such a boys club growing up and like growing up now and seeing the amount of incredible female skateboarders that now like other women have role models to look up to and be like, hey, I can do this too. And now I see girls at the skate park every time I'm there. And I never used to see that. I think mentioning that, I think Avril Levine is actually a skateboarder now. Like, it's what we love to do. And, you know, so much has been put into this, like, collectively between all of the musicians in our community and in other communities globally, that just, like, the love can't die. And so you kind of have to remain optimistic that there's going to be a good outlet coming for it soon enough, you know? Good call. I really, I really think that there will be. One of the things that got me into doing looping as much as I am right now was I started going to the open mic at Vapor Central. It's like this famous pot cafe that existed and is closed now uh, oh, yes, at exactly. Young and Bloor. Right. You know, they had a Sunday show. Mike Rita, professional comedian, was hosting every yeah. Sunday and killing the room, like, you know, well enough that he's like an international touring comedian now. Wow. Um, and he would sell out like a 200 person stoner bar every Sunday. And he would have me open the show whenever I would show up. So so I would go there and do like a 15, 20 minute set of music to start off a comedy show, basically. And and it was really cool to see just like the different vibe that we created over alcohol. You know, where alcohol, you might have people that are really there enjoying the music, but are rather loud and ready to party and like kind of rambunctious and not paying so much attention, which is fine again. But weed was like people just sink into the couch and zone out and are like just right in it. Wow. And uh, they're, it's, it's funny because like the reactions are pretty delayed. Like you finish the song and they're just like, whoa. Oh, like, <laughs> but, um, well, that's an interesting but, perception it, that they, but it, it creates, right it creates yeah. a list environment to be in. Right. So then years later, after doing that, Mark Emery started doing cannabis culture, which is like right before we became legalized, he had, uh, this chain of pot shops in Toronto operating illegally. The cannabis culture is his brand. And the flagship location was at Church and Wellesley. And because I was performing at Vapor Central a lot, I got the chance to host the open mic there, um, which I can still say to this day was like my favorite job I ever had. They paid me well. And it was a crazy fun show and obviously rather debaucherous, but like a ton of fun. Uh, and again, just like having a music centric listening room kind of environment for a music show to happen was fantastic. I haven't really seen that happen many other places, right? Now what happened when legalization came in was like they they threw weed in with the smoke free act, which meant that yes, we're allowed to go smoke outside, but no smoking inside anywhere. That's illegal. Because pot was illegal already and it was like a gray area without established rules, people were just kind of ignoring it. Uh and they were able to sort of get away with doing that. And now that weed can't be smoked inside at all, it's a different story for these sorts of establishments that are trying to do that, right? So until they're able to make um, a smoke-free tobacco act or some sort of like licensed cannabis smoking environment, 
uh, we're not going to be able to sort of have that happen again just because the law has changed on it, which is ironic. It's like, legalize it. Okay, we didn't. All right, I can't go play there anymore. Shit. But, yeah, but, but I did say, but, I did say yeah. CBDs and gummies. Yeah, okay, so CBDs and gummies. When, when that smoke-free act came in, Vapor Central first tried to find ways around it. So they were like vaporizing inside. And yeah, they would sell edibles. Um, it would be cool to see something like that return to form. But honestly, it yeah. would be one of those things like, hey, we have this bar, but you can only have beer here. If you want to have shots, you got to go outside. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was kind of like, uh, okay, I guess, but a little weird. So that's true. True. I, I think to get the full effect, and, and at the very least, like the place that's popular is going to be the one that kind of lets people do what they want, right? Um, so if that's able to get sorted out, I would like to see that come back because I thought that the environment of like weed and music was great as a performer. I, I would have never smoke and play because that just fucking terrifies me. <laughs> um, I've done it before. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> and, but like the people who are in the audience is just like such a different experience from drinking, sure. right? Alex uh, like once said, if um, smoking before you play makes you think you sound better, but you don't. It can be a good uh, creative impetus sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I don't even think it is necessarily always. There's a lot of people I know who are like, oh, I can only write if I get high, man. I'm like, that sucks. No, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it, it can be cool. I definitely don't think it helps me play any better. <laughs> yeah, but sure. yeah, it, it can certainly push right. someone in a different direction. And I think that same nudge that pushes them in a different direction makes them a very different kind of audience member too, right? So. Yeah, that was a very interesting uh, answer to that question. Cool. I'm glad you think so. <laughs> I, well, we've I had this weird course. opportunity to be around weed and music together in that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very interesting opportunity. Um, and unique to this era, which is yeah. now it's season eight. You're you're basically uh, eight point three, episode three in season eight. And fortunately, nice. we've had the opportunity to interview three women so far. Cool. And that's uh, the Command Sisters and Devon Gray. And, since you're looking this way and I'm looking that way, yeah. Uh, why don't you tell us about some of these posters? Oh yeah, sure. Um, I'd actually like to do a longer video on this at some point, but basically, I I wanted some kind of a background in here to shoot videos, and so I had the idea of just like I'm gonna start putting up show posters in the background, right? So uh, it stems all the way from like uh, say EP launch in 20. 13 2012 2013 of like my first recorded material it's okay um <laughs> the show is great but you know just all sorts of different memories i used to run a showcase series called acoustic addiction um so those are up there different indie week events um you know opening for other bands and stuff like that i've got a poster up on the other side here that you can't see of uh the show i did with mono whales some i did with my dad you know all sorts of memories it's a good thing to be able to just look at the wall and just be reminded of like yeah this is who's coming back and i'm excited for it whenever it does but yeah a lot of memories on the wall man Dylan, how do we get you online you can find me on my websites so for my band mobius radio it is mobius radio.rocks uh you can also find me at dylan hennessy music.com search me up on socials it's just dylan hennessy dylan like bob hennessy like the drink both felt the same way um and YouTube, Dylan Hennessy, on Instagram, all that stuff. The only thing I don't use really is Twitter. Otherwise, come find me. And, uh, and bring Tim's. <laughs> what do you use the most? Uh, probably Facebook, to be honest. Yeah. Fa me Facebook too. and Instagram would be the two best places. Me too. That's why I follow you. Hey, there we go. Yeah. You're a good Facebook. I feel like fa Facebook is just kind of becoming like the Walmart of social media, but here we are, you know. It's got everything we need. It is because Instagram, there's not enough writers. It's a lot of picture well, there's, there's just no writing. But yeah. I also find Instagram to be much more of a feel-good platform for that. You don't get these long friggin' comment battles with no people rants. going off on each other. No right. rants. It's just like, here's a picture. Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? If I, if I don't want to think about the direction of the world and people's crazy ass politics, I'm going to go on Instagram probably. And just be like, great, my friend's coming up with a song. Oh, cool clip of guitar. 
I like that. <laughs> Much easier. And so your stuff's on YouTube too, right? Yep, I try to post as much on YouTube as I can. Uh, yep. Try to use the platform a lot. Do you have a lot of videos on? Huh? 150 or so, yeah. Went to school for independent music production. It's, it's in the name and I, I'm kind of trained to do that, right? So cool. it, it's been nice to be like, Dylan, all you have right now is production. So do it. And a lot's gotten done. I, again, I got to sort through and figure out how to release it all and do some final tweaks on a bunch of stuff to put it out, but there's like a lot of music to release this year. I'm really excited about it. Okay, one last question then. Yeah. Is that COVID hair? Are you getting a haircut as soon as you're allowed? Could you believe that I got a haircut two weeks ago? Like it was down to here, man. I hadn't gotten a haircut in a year and a half. You were allowed to get a haircut. There was this brief window of like two weeks and I got it done. <laughs> Good for you, support the stylists. Yeah, I mean, I tried, <laughs> got the haircut, and this it's so much easier to deal with. Oh, my God. And even still, it's like, because it's just, like, been rocking the long hair, no one would notice. <laughs> yeah. Crazy, man. Okay, great talking to you. Enjoy your Timmy's. We'll oh, stay, I will. I think I'm going to go. Stay in touch uh, online. We will. Can't wait to hey, see thank you. Thank you for having me back. on. Much appreciated. It's been a pleasure chatting. And uh, we'll actually go grab a beer in a bar at some point soon enough, I'm sure. Looking forward to that. Cheers, buddy. What song yeah, should sure. I add to the playlist after the interview? Recently, we released a cover of The Real Slim Shady. It's one that we always get asked to do at shows. And so me and Alex went to Iguana Studios and recorded a version of it. And it finally got up on YouTube very recently. So let's pop over to that. It's probably a good place to start. It's a pretty high energy Mobius radio song that we like to play at just about every show that we do. Uh, so we'll do a live video of the mountain recorded at Iguana Studios for Mobius Radio. Cool. Thanks again for being on Musicians in Bars getting beer. Yeah, musicians at home drinking kidneys. Cheers. All right, man. Cheers, bud.